Facebook Live viewers. Welcome to another virtual visit here to the aquarium. This is Taylor and my name is Nick. Hopefully you guys are returners and you're a little bit familiar with us at this point, but if you're just watching for the first time, welcome in. Taylor and I have done a couple of these um, over the time here. And today we, are, uh, we decided we wanted to tackle a particularly interesting topic, something that we often get questions about uh, as educators, and that is, how do we get our animals? Turns out it's not so simple of a question to answer. Every animal actually gets a little bit of a different story. Um, and so we're going to expand on that a little bit today. Just a reminder right off the top, if you guys have any questions about something that you've heard or something that you haven't heard, make sure to submit that question in the comments section. And Taylor and I will do our best to try to answer that at the <laughs> end, okay? So let's jump into it. You ready? Let's do it. Okay, so we're coming to you today from the fourth floor of the building in our Yaki Coral Reef Center. And pardon the announcement that's about to come over the speakers here, but we'll do our best to kind of press through that. Hopefully you guys can still hear us okay. One, again, one of the questions that we often get here is how do we get our animals? How do they arrive here to the aquarium? So having a plan in place for animal collection and transport is a necessary component of really any aquarium and the New England Aquarium is no different. We have a plan in place for virtually every, well, essentially every animal that we have here. <laughs> Um, our collection committee will start by considering a number of factors, and those factors include big picture items, such as whether an animal supports our mission, whether it advances animal care practices, um, or if it represents a particular research project that some of our researchers are focused on right now. Once we've dealt with those factors, we'll consider some other factors, more practical factors, including um, how well we understand what an animal needs to survive. That's pretty important. Feels pretty basic, yeah. Um, <laughs> our exhibit capacity. Um, you know, a lot of people want to see us feature huge animals like whale sharks and humpback whales and things like that. Unfortunately, there are a lot of things that surround the care of those animals, one of them being capacity. We just don't have the capacity for bigger animals like that. Um, other factors considered at a more practical level include whether we can successfully quarantine the animals first and then whether we can take care of an animal for their entire life. Just like humans, needs of animals certainly change over the course of their lives as they may go through different changes themselves. So we want to make sure that we can meet all of those different needs during that time. Now these questions aren't so simple, but once they've all been resolved, we will move towards uh, deciding whether we are still interested and able to get a particular animal. And I think I'm going to throw it over to Taylor now and she's going to talk a little bit more about some of the different ways that animals come here. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. You got it. Yeah, so as Nick mentioned at the start, it's not um, as straightforward as you may think because there are in fact a number of ways that we get our animals here at the aquarium. Now, the first way is maybe the one that you might immediately think of. We do occasionally go out to the wild to collect animals, um, but these collection trips are pretty strategic um, and they happen at designated times of year with permitting in place and a very specific list of what animals that we will be collecting on that trip. And again, all of the animals on that list are pre-approved by the collection committee that Nick mentioned. Um, there's kind of two big trips that come to mind when we think about collecting in the wild. One is done in Maine, uh, in East Port Harbor, where we go up and we look for local New England residents. And then a second trip is for probably one of our most popular exhibits here at the New England Aquarium and definitely our largest our giant ocean tank. We do a collection trip to the Bahamas in which our dive staff will actually go down with, again, that specific list of animals looking for animals to call our giant ocean tank home. The next way that we often get animals uh, for our institution is by working with other AZA accredited institutions. So other accredited zoos and aquariums. And um, we will often share and exchange animals. And this can happen in a few different ways. Perhaps they might have a surplus animal, an animal that they don't have room for anymore, or vice versa. And 
they'll communicate with the wider network of aquariums and say, hey, I have this animal, does anyone have space? And if we have space, then we'll work on getting it transported here or vice versa. Um, occasionally, we also work with other zoos and aquariums that have specific breeding programs for animals that we do not have breeding programs for. And for those aquariums, they're often looking for places to take the animals after their babies. Because again, space is definitely a factor as Nick already mentioned. Now, another way that we sometimes get animals uh, here at the aquarium, um, this one is probably the least frequent way that we get animals at the aquarium, um, and that is rescues. Um, I would say that the probably best place to see rescues here at the aquarium is um, in our marine mammals center. We do get a lot of rescued seals and these are animals that simply would not be able to survive back in the wild. So they need to be able to call a place like the New England Aquarium home. Um, but another great example is actually from the gallery that we are currently standing in. Um, we participate in something called the Gulf Stream Orphan Project. Um, Gulfstream orphans are tropical fish, actually Caribbean species, that end up in warm water currents that push them northward, sometimes all the way up here to New England. However, as the waters cool down, those tropical babies cannot survive the winter. So our divers will go out and actually this, they work with our dive club, which I think is pretty cool. And they'll look for those tropical animals up in the New England areas. And it's a challenge because they're tiny, they're really small. Um, but then once they find them, we'll bring them back behind the scenes and raise them up. And oftentimes the Yaki Gallery is their first destination on exhibit before they get big enough to go into our giant ocean tank, which is pretty cool. So sometimes you can see some Gulfstream orphans right here in our Yaki Gallery. So that's a cool example of rescues. Now the final way that we get animals is actually um, probably one of the most sustainable ways or one of the more sustainable ways um, that zoos and aquariums can get animals and that's by breeding them. Now I mentioned that other zoos and aquariums have breeding programs, but surprise, surprise, so do we. Um, and actually in the tank right behind me, you can see uh, the product of one of our breeding programs. There's a species in here called brown chromis, um, which is a small fish and they are part of our larval fish rearing program here at the New England Aquarium. Um, we've been working on this for a number of years, actually collecting eggs from our adult animals, raising those eggs up through little tiny fry, which are baby fish, all the way through adults, and then they end up back on exhibit here at the New England Aquarium. Um, besides our little brown chromis here behind me, another great place to see this is in our giant ocean tank. There's a really large school of fish in there, they are silver with yellow stripes and they are called smallmouth grunts. And we have, I think, 300 or so of them in there right now, which actually makes up almost half of the population of the giant ocean tank. And those guys were all raised by us at the New England Aquarium for the New England Aquarium, which is really cool. So those are kind of the major ways that we typically get animals here at the New England Aquarium. And, um, as you can see, it's a variety of reasons. So for any given animal here at the New England Aquarium, the question, where did that animal come from or how did you get that animal can be pretty diverse. Um, I think at this point, we love to talk about a specific example, one animal story of how did it get here to the New England Aquarium because Nick and I think it's a pretty cool story and it actually has to do with the tank that Nick is standing next to. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Nick to share that story. Thank you, Taylor. I just would like to take a moment to also acknowledge that one of the educators on this presentation did a great job memorizing her script, <laughs> while the other one didn't do such a great job, which is why he's got some notes in front of him. But I'm gonna do my best to tell this story because like Taylor said, this animal does have a particularly unique, interesting story, which is why we chose the location for this filming right now. And Taylor referenced that in fact, this animal does live in the tank that's right behind us here. It's called a black brotula. And I'm gonna point it out because it's right next to me. You guys might have trouble seeing it on the screen, but it's this very small dark colored fish that has very wavy fins on the top and bottom of its body. Again, it's called a black brotula, and it's a very interesting, unique animal that has a really fun story here. So let's dig into it. All right. So back in 2012, plans began to develop the Yaki Coral Reef Center, which is again, where we're standing up on the fourth floor of the building here. 
and this was going to be a gallery that would feature uh, small animals found on Caribbean reefs. This was an opportunity to highlight animals that would be sort of too small to view from the windows of our giant ocean tank. But again, also, if you think about some of the animals that you might remember from our giant ocean tank, if you're someone that's visited the aquarium before, we've got big animals like turtles and eels and sharks, larger species, but there are plenty of small specimens that live on reefs that are very cryptic and often hard to find. We wanted to make sure that we got a chance to highlight those as well. So in thinking about the candidates that would sort of fit that model, a black brotula was chosen as a potential candidate. And to our knowledge at that time, there were no other aquariums in the world that were displaying black rotulas. And that's always a point of pride for <laughs> aquariums to be able to um, display and show off those really amazing, unique animals. But, you know, of course, we want to also be able to learn more about caring for these animals and share that with other institutions as well. Now, this particular species of black rotula presented some unique and interesting challenges. Number one, again, there are very small species. Full-grown adults may only get to maybe four or five inches long, um, and they can generally spend most of their time between four feet all the way down to 300 foot of depth. And that's a pretty wide range um, to look for a particular animal. That's also a range at the bottom at the 300 foot depth that makes it very hard to access, particularly <laughs> for somebody that's just scuba diving. Um, the habitat preferences for the animal were very particular as well. They liked cooler temperatures, darker light levels, and they're typically found in caves and caverns, which not only presents exhibiting challenges, but also, again, to be able to find a specimen, to be able to actually collect them can be a little bit of a challenge. At the time, very little was also known about this particular species. Um, a full description of black rotula care and behavior wasn't really available until a book was published around 2006. Uh, we were able to use this as a reference, thankfully, and we actually were in contact with the author of the book as well. Previously, before this, there was a lot of sort of incorrect information about this particular species, and that can happen just based off the fact that not enough information or data has been collected yet about a particular species to exactly understand um, uh, you know, all their preferences and things like that. I think definitely, especially for deep reef animals or deep ocean animals, it's a little harder to observe their behavior <laughs> as is. humans. Yeah. It certainly is. That's right. Yeah. Um, this animal and, you know, again, we, we didn't fully understand this until we had a chance to learn um, from the author of that 2006 book that describes some of the behaviors and preferences, but uh, has very distinct feeding behaviors um, that would require us to okay. deliver. Oh, pardon our light going off there for a second. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, presented certain challenges for being able to help uh, that animal feed regularly and stay nice and healthy. Okay, so how to, how to actually make this all happen? How to put this all together? Well, um, to our understanding, the collection agency that helped us with this had to actually use a submersible, a robotic machine that actually would allow them to go down deep enough to collect this animal. Taylor and I were talking about that before the presentation. We, we weren't able to fully confirm that, and so we can definitely follow up, but we believe they used the submersible to reach the necessary depth to find the specimen. Um, once the animal is collected, it had to go through holding with the collection company, had to go through transport to actually make it here. And we haven't really fully uh, sort of tackled the topic of transporting animals from place to place, but that presents a, a whole other complex set of issues, including how to set the right temperature in a transport uh, container or device or truck, if you're gonna be moving an animal from place to place in a truck, um, how to set up a light su life support. Oh, we're back on, here we go, <laughs> lights back. Um, complex, uh, a lot of things to consider in, mm -hmm. as it relates to transport that we're not, again, we're not totally getting into detail there, but anyway. That's another Facebook Live. We'll save that side. for another one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so eventually the animal will arrive here and then it also has to go through a quarantining period with us as well, eventually, our black brotula, our first specimen, made it to an exhibit here in the Yaki Coral Reef Center. And it technically wasn't this exhibit at the time. It was an exhibit that looked a little bit different, was smaller, more like one of the exhibits that Taylor is actually standing right next to now, something the size of that. Eventually, uh, or, so when we first displayed the animal, it actually helped us to learn a little bit more about feeding preferences helped our aquarists to feel comfortable that they could um, do all the things necessary to keep this animal nice and safe and healthy. 
and eventually it was moved to this exhibit over here. Now we've learned a lot, again, about the successful care um, and reproductive behaviors as well of black Brotulas. And in fact, uh, not too long after we displayed this animal on exhibit, it started to actually uh, unexpectedly display, display the fact, um, at, I guess, excuse me, at the time we, we had two specimens. We had a male and a female specimen. And our female showed us that she was actually pregnant with babies. And so that uh, caused a whole another suite of things to think about in terms of care for that animal. Um, we were able to actually gain a lot of knowledge and understanding about the reproductive behaviors and the, the larvae of black rotulas and their needs to be able to survive. Um, and so eventually this uh, specimen, the black rotula, sort of joined the group of specimens, and Taylor was referencing one in the exhibit right behind her, that's part of our larval rearing program. And so we still have a lot to learn from the specimen, but it was an unexpected sort of add-on to uh, having this animal displayed in some of our exhibits. And so kind of a wild story, a lot of stuff there. Um, hopefully that was clear enough for you guys to understand if you have any questions about that. Again, put them in the comments section. But that's just one animal. Again, <laughs> we keep referencing that, but, uh, this, but that's just one, one type of animal that we have at the aquarium that had that complex of a level of things in order to get here. Okay, Taylor's gonna wrap things up for us now. Well, should we take some questions first? Oh yeah, you know, that's probably a good <laughs> idea. We should take some questions. Yeah. yeah, so again, if you have questions, just put those in the comments and Nick and I will do our very best to answer them. And if we can't answer them live, we will do our best to answer them in the comments after our presentation is over. So I guess at this point, Vanessa, do we have any questions from our viewers? Victoria would like to know, where do the penguins come from? Ah, great question. Where do the penguins come from? Nick, do you want to take that one? Let's tag team this one. I'll awesome. start us off and you can finish. Yeah, so that's a great question. We have displayed penguins here at the aquarium for quite a long time. I don't, I don't know if Taylor remembers the date when we first had our colony, but I believe it was back in the 70s. Is that right? I think they might have been one of the initial species that we had upon opening. When I think opens? we had a small number of African penguins when okay. we first opened the aquarium. Right on. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to rely on Taylor's uh, stronger brain than mine to correct <laughs> me here. Uh, but but my, my thinking is that uh, those animals may not have been directly c collected by people that worked for us here at the aquarium, but they, a lot of them were collected from the wild. And so um, that was sort of the start of our colony here. And eventually over time, people that are uh, aquarium fans and have kept up on what's happening with our penguin colony know that we actually have been breeding penguins here at the aquarium for a while as well. And actually at this point, as of right now, all the penguins in our colony, and I believe we have in the range of 75 to 80. Does that sound right that to you, Taylor? That's right, yeah. Um, all of those penguins have been born in human care. A lot of them here at our aquarium, a lot of them at other zoos and aquariums that are part of the species survival plans for those particular species. Yeah. How did I do? I think you did pretty good. Okay. I think the other thing that I'll mention in relation to penguins is that rules for collecting animals from the wild often change over time. That's a good point. Um, in relationship to things like their endangered status, um, their conservation status, um, also to um, the kind of threats in their wild populations or just simply the laws and regulations in the countries where those animals are found. So nowadays, the only way penguins can come out of the wild is in a rescue situation. If they are um, in a position where they could not support themselves in the wild, um, oftentimes this has to do with things like oil spills, um, birds that are too unhealthy to bring back um, to the wild or spend so much time in human care recovering that it's not safe for them to go back to the wild. Um, so wild penguins are actually incredibly rare in zoos and aquariums mm. these days. Um, I think up until about three years ago, we had a penguin that was two generations removed from the wild, but even that is pretty rare these days for penguins in zoos and aquariums. That's why it takes two of us to answer <laughs> questions like that, right? Sometimes. Yeah. Do we have another question, Vanessa? Um, well, that brings us what percentage are injured and can't return to the wild? Um, penguins specifically or just animals in general? Animals. What percentage wow. um, can't go back to the wild? 
Well, so yeah, that's a, we can kind of split that question into two parts. I think the first part of the question, if I'm right, Vanessa, was what percentage were injured and thus can't and thus can't go back into the wild. So technically, part of the laws that govern how we collect animals and keep them here at the aquarium state that once an animal comes to the aquarium, uh, the majority of our animals have to spend the rest of their life here with us. They're not, there's not a plan in place to re-release them back into the wild. An exception to that would be our sea turtle rescue and rehab program, which operates out of a facility down in Quincy, Mass. And again, if you guys are fans of our Facebook Live series and other virtual content that's been up on our uh, different platforms, and you've probably heard quite a bit about the <laughs> turtle rescue and rehab program, um, in recent times, we highlighted a particular loggerhead sea turtle named Munchkin that has a really fun story. Make sure to do a search for Munchkin on our YouTube page to learn a lot more about her particular story. Um, but I, I digress a little bit there. Uh, again, part of our collection procedures are that we need to keep the animals here for the remainder of their lives. Now, there are certain concerns when you take in an animal in relation to what might change for them in terms of their ability to survive in the wild. We do our best to provide care to our animals that allows them to maintain their normal behaviors and doesn't change things like even feeding habits and things like that. But despite all of that, there are likely to be things that might change for animals. They certainly might get a little bit more used to feeding in a particular way or feeding on a particular thing that we can offer them here at the aquarium that might slightly vary to what their normal situation would be like if they were living in the wild. And so there are concerns that if we were to release all these animals back into the wild, they may not be able to have the appropriate behaviors for their wild environment. And so there are concerns that they'd be able to survive as well there as they can here. And so uh, certainly there are records of animals that we have taken in here that may have been injured. Uh, but most of the time, again, with the exception of our turtles, that doesn't necessarily affect whether or not they're going to go back into the wild. If they have been collected by us or another uh, group, another aquarium or zoo, and come to us here, um, almost, again, almost in every case, they're not going to go back into the wild just as part of our policy. Usually zoos and aquariums, they need to have a specific plan in place for rehabilitating and releasing animals because they have to be cared for during that rehabilitation in a really specific way and actually under really careful quarantine procedures because of the big piece and the biggest probably the biggest reason why we can't just release animals back into the wild is that they're exposed to germs in zoos and aquariums that they would never be exposed to in the wild and this is simply because we have animals from all around the world and we wouldn't want to inadvertently add something into an environment that could negatively impact the wild population. So for our sea turtles, it is a very, very strict lockdown facility where mm -hmm. we don't even walk from one side of our Quincy facility where we have our animals for our giant ocean tank to the other side where the turtles are because that's how strict we are about that quarantine protocol, making sure that those animals aren't exposed to anything that can negatively impact the wild population when they go back. Um, so it's kind of something that you have to plan for from the beginning, and that's why releasing animals can be kind of tricky. Yeah, right on. Do we have any other questions out there today? Uh, yeah, related question. What does quarantine look like for fishes, and why do they need to do it before they go on exhibit? Awesome uh -huh. question. So why do we have to quarantine our fish, and what does fish quarantine look like? Um, so the reason why we have to quarantine our animals is a little bit what I just mentioned. We wanna make sure there's nothing in their bodies or on their bodies that if introduced to our healthy exhibits could make our animals sick. So in this case, we're thinking viruses, bacteria, fungus, parasites, anything that we don't want in our healthy exhibits that these fish might bring in with them from the wild. So we'll monitor them, we'll watch them, We'll do things like skin scrapes, so they'll just like scrape a, a slide against their, their, their scales and, and check out if there's anything growing on their bodies underneath the microscope, which is pretty cool. Um, and we'll also do things like water testing, seeing if there's anything in the water like parasites that wasn't in the water before that fish was introduced. 
And if they have any of this stuff, we can then treat them. Our exceptional uh, animal health team will jump in and treat them for any fungus, parasites, bacteria, you name it. And once they are um, deemed healthy, um, then they can be added into our exhibit tanks. What it looks like can vary from animal to animal. And for fish, typically it means living in a designated holding tank behind the scenes that's kind of set up for that quarantine that's not sharing water with other tanks and other systems so again it stays pretty separate um, and habitat might not be as elaborate uh, as what you see on exhibit but it's really functional again easy to clean and easy to change out from animal to animal did was, i miss anything there Nick? no that was great okay uh, i was just gonna <laughs> say there's a uh, something going on in our world right now that uh, involves sort of a version of a human <laughs> quarantine. Um, it's certainly not the same as what would go on for a fish coming to the aquarium, but you can kind of think of it in similar terms. We're trying to isolate these animals in an area where we can carefully monitor all the things that Taylor mentioned. Once we're confident 100% that they're not carrying anything that they could pass on to another animal then they're done they're through quarantine and they're allowed to go on to exhibit with other animals yeah so i'd also say that's one of the reasons why we have to consider quarantining in our process of whether or not to collect an animal yeah exactly right or get an animal from another place yeah great question yeah is that it for this morning awesome well my friends thank you so much for all of your wonderful questions and again if you do have some more questions feel free to post them and nick and i will check in and with the assistance of our lovely social media coordinator marissa we'll, we'll get those uh, questions answered for you um, but we hope that you've learned a little bit more about how we get our animals here at the new england aquarium you might have a better appreciation for why that can be such a tricky question for educators to answer on the fly uh, the next time you come and visit the aquarium and we are also just so excited to be able to share part this part of the animal story with you all. Um, we are so pleased to be able to share the stories of these animals. These animals come to us so that they can be ambassadors for their wild counterparts and help our visitors learn and appreciate about them and the places that they come from. And we are just honored to be part of their story. So thank you for letting us share with you today. We hope you all have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you back here again soon. Thanks friends.